Why didn't I know about this before? These were British citizens who were under Nazi occupation for five years. That's a fascinating story. Marianne was much more interested in human stories, and this is a great, a truly great human story. She cared about people who were humane and inhumane circumstances and people who led with their hearts when it was not to their benefit, people who put themselves in peril because of their principles. And the story of Guernsey's occupation has all of those elements. The first part of Guernsey mentioned in the book is the manor house and farm. The house is in St. Martin's, one of 10 parishes, and close to the south coast of Guernsey and near the cliffs. The manor house was owned by Amelia Morgry, who urgently calls on Dorsey Adams to come round with a butcher's knife. She had a pig, a hidden pig, and she invited me to join in the feast with her and her friends. This ended up being the first meeting of the Guernsey Literary and Potato Peel Pie Society. It didn't actually exist at first, but was a story made up by Elizabeth when they were stopped by German soldiers who caught them on their way home after the curfew. St. Martin's is the home of several characters, including Dorsey, who lived in La Bouvée Lane, near La Bouvée Farm. And Sir Ambrose also owned a home nearby on the clifftops. Elizabeth's mother had worked for him as a housekeeper. When she died, Sir Ambrose looked after Elizabeth. Eben Ramsey lived just down the road in Calais Lane. His house was called Les Pommiers. Parts of the beautiful harbour would have looked similar when Dorsey worked there, loading and unloading all the main supplies that would have come into the island after the occupation. These would have included food, seed, tools, clothes, medicines, all vital supplies for a population who had been left with nothing. The harbour is described by Eben as he writes about the heartbreaking scenes as thousands of children were evacuated before the occupation. Eli left Guernsey on the 20th of June along with the thousands of babies and school children who were evacuated to England. We did not have any news of the children for six months. Families were apart from their children for five years with very little contact. Eben had taken his grandchild, Eli, to visit his mother who was sick in hospital just before he was evacuated. She died soon after, along with her newborn baby, the day the Germans bombed the harbour just metres away from the hospital. Today, the hospital is no longer there, but the building is now the island's police headquarters. In the story, Eben writes to tell Juliet of how the occupation started. They came here on the Sunday the 30th of June, 1940, after bombing us two days before, killing some 30 men, women and children. Seven German planes had flown low over St. Peterport, dropping bombs on the tomato trucks waiting to be loaded on boats at the harbour. They'd mistaken them for army trucks. Isola also talks about the Germans arriving in one of her letters. She says the Germans walked through the town like they were on holiday. Indeed, many thought they were, thinking they were there for a stop-off before going to London to fight. She describes the chilling moment when they heard the sound of soldiers goose-stepping through the high street. Everything about them gleamed. Buttons, boots, those metal coal scuttle hats. Their eyes didn't see anyone or anything, just stared straight ahead. The scene outside Lloyd's Bank has hardly changed. The footsteps are now of tourists and islanders going about their business. On the other side of the harbour is the Fisherman's Quay. Eben, a fisherman, would have landed his catch here each day. He describes loving being at sea, but during the occupation had to surrender the larger share of his catch to the Germans. The Crown Hotel is mentioned by Dorsey in a letter to Juliet. He says he was working on the roof, heaving slates. The building still exists in the heart of St. Peterport, but is now a pub called the Ship and Crown. Like many of the island's significant properties, Grange Lodge Hotel was commandeered by the Germans and used as a headquarters. 
In the book, we learn that all the Jews report there and have their passbook stamped. Elizabeth warns John Booker not to go as she realized it was not going to end well. John Booker then pretended to be his employer, Lord Tobias, who had fled from the island just before the Germans arrived. He lived at La Forte Manor in St. Martins and is most likely to be Sommeray Manor, which is on Fort Road. He pretended to be Lord Tobias for most of the war before someone reported him to the Germans and he was arrested. Amelia writes to Juliet on the 10th of April, 1946. In her letter, she describes many of the structures the Germans built around the island. The coastal fortifications were absurd. The Channel Isles were better fortified than the Atlantic Wall built against an Allied invasion. The installations loomed over every bay. She talks about concrete bunkers, which were built around the coast and to this day still exist. The Myris batteries with huge guns with ranges up to around 50 kilometers. The vast network of underground tunnels that were built by slave workers and still exist. Many died in the process and were treated terribly. Some of the best descriptions are from Juliet as she views the island with fresh eyes. She compares this to how fellow writer Victor Hugo may have felt when he arrived for the first time on the island before settling there. I saw St. Peterport rising from the sea with a church at the top like a cake decoration and I realised my heart was galloping. Dorsey takes Juliet on a tour in her first few days. One of the stops is still one of the most popular tourist attractions, the Little Chapel. A work of art and labour of love built by a monk living in the monastery next door and planned to create a miniature version of the famous grotto and basilica at Lourdes in France. Cliff walks are popular with islanders, especially the beach cafes and kiosks to be found along the way. We all walked together into St. Peterport. We took the cliff path by Fermain Bay. It's beautiful, a rugged path that wanders up and around the headland. The book gives several accounts of the liberation of Guernsey. Misha Daniels tells Juliet about the ships outside the harbour. These were the British Navy ships, including HMS Bulldog, which is where the Germans signed the papers agreeing to surrender. And uh, our dear Channel Islands are also to be free today. I hope that People come to see Guernsey as a model for undefining one's enemy. The behavior of the people of Guernsey during the occupation provides a different kind of an example, an example of disagreeing yet coming to balance, perhaps, that we can all use. <laughs>